and the, the king in his court. Anybody ever heard of Eddie Feiner? Okay, Eddie Feiner was a, uh, a showman starting in the 1940s, a, a, a saw, uh, a play with softball, hard pitch softball. He had this, this incredible ability to pitch uh, hard, hard pitch, fast pitch softball. He could do it blindfolded, he could do it from second base, and he could strike anybody out. It was uh, uh, this uh, Eddie Feiner, <coughs> the king in his court, toward the United States. Four of them would play, not nine on the field, four would play. So you had Eddie Feiner as the pitcher, you had a catcher, and then you had two fielders, and they took on all comers. And in uh, uh, the summer uh, of 1968, they came to Pottstown. They played a team of Spring City uh, uh, All Stars. I'm sorry, Spring Ford All Stars. They they played them for three innings. The All Stars were losing five to one, and then the Firebirds came in, and at the end the score was nine to six. Now the Firebirds claimed that they actually had beaten Eddie Feiner because they had outscored him five to four, but uh, the the uh, uh, the end result uh, was that uh, Eddie Feiner was was striking out uh, well over a dozen batters. Uh, it, one of these uh, incredible guys who, who uh, had, had, a, had a talent, including picking off one of the Firebirds, um, I think it was Carmen Cavalli, picked him off first base from a th uh, throw from behind his back. So, again, part of the hoopla that was going on uh, in, in the summer of 1968. Other players were being signed by the Firebirds. Bob Pelkington, uh, six foot seven, 255 pounds. He was also a former Philadelphia Bulldog. Uh, Ed Pine, who had come out from Temple University. So throughout the summer, players are arriving in Pottstown. You, they started with a large roster, and then throughout the summer, throughout August, they would whittle down to get to their final roster. We also see throughout that period the mercury being used in these full-page spreads promoting the Firebirds. You know, um, it, it, yeah, I'm going to show a few more. Just the. Today, you may, see, you may see these as somewhat hokey, somewhat corny, but this was really the way uh, uh, the press was in, in, in the 1960s. A lot of this uh, uh, kind of uh, jazz to, to gin up attention and gin up enthusiasm about the Firebirds. Other public events. Here you have uh, Buddy Allen, who was the, uh, one of the halfbacks defensive halfbacks for the, uh, or defensive backs for the Firebirds, throwing out these uh, little souvenir uh, footballs about this size to students. This is at um, uh, Lincoln Elementary School to the students at Lincoln. Um, over here you had uh, Michael Urban, Michael Hugh Urban. He, was, uh, he had just been born, and he became the youngest stockholder for the Pottstown Firebirds. <laughs> and here you had Firebirds kites. I don't remember them. I'm sure someone in this room may remember seeing Pottstown Firebird kites, but there's kites being flown again at the at the high school. So all kind of all this PR effort to kind of you know get get people enthusiastic uh, about the Firebirds. Again, more effort the the uh, the summer of '68, showing the you know the aches and pains of some of the players, some of the training room stuff that's going on. A little later on in the season, uh, one of the uh, staff writers for the Pottstown Mercury um, did a uh, got to join the the Firebirds on a practice, uh, an imitation of, of uh, George Plimpton. Anybody rem remember George Plimpton, uh, Paper Lion? He had uh, actually uh, joined the, the Lions without the the players knowing that he was actually a journalist and not or writer and not not an actual football player. He lasted like one series. Uh, in an exhibition game, uh, but then he wrote a book about it for um, that was quite successful called Paper Lion. And here you have the Potsdam Mercury uh, reporter kind of being assigned to imitate George Plimpton and practice with the brutal Firebirds. Uh, the headlines, by the way, from this period are just incredible. Um, uh, really good, uh, good writing. Um, you kind of miss it, you know. You kind of miss all this wonderful um, uh, press journalism. Uh, today. We're moving forward. Summer of 68, practice squad, 
They've now whittled down their roster. They have their first exhibition game. First exhibition game is on August 17th. August 17th. Uh, the Firebirds are going to host Harrisburg Capitals. Uh, the quarterback of the Firebirds for the first game, Jim Haney. Ironically, Jim Haney quarterbacked the first game of the Firebirds, and he quarterbacked uh, the last game of the Potsdam Firebirds in 1970. Just to kind of that's talk about Firebirds trivia. Um, that that's uh, he he quarterbacked the championship game in '70 up in Hartford, and he also quarterbacked the first exhibition and then the first regular season game uh, for the Firebirds. Firebirds lost 10 nothing. Um, Haney started that game. Zeke Morano was supposed to start, but he had suffered a concussion. So, um, so Haney started the first game, and they lost. It was a home opener, but they had, a, a, again, a, a big crowd, a low-scoring affair, obviously. <coughs> Their second exhibition game, a week later, they traveled down to Herndon, Virginia, to play the Virginia Sailors. They won 17-10. On a trick play in the last minute and a half, uh, at this point, Murano was actually quarterbacking them in this game. The trick play was he threw a lateral pass to Ed Pine, the flanker, and then Pine um, passed to John Fonash uh, for, for a touchdown pass. This had occurred right after a, an interception by Steve Spears, and this was their first victory. It was an exhibition game, though, but again, it was a bit, this is the first, uh, first time they tasted victory. Um, two weeks later, the home opener, the beginning of the 1968 season, September 7th, 1968, there were 6,150 people at Franklin Field. It became Grigg, but at the time um, it was still Franklin Field. Coincidentally, Franklin Field was where the Eagles played in Philadelphia at the time. So you had the Eagles playing in Franklin Field, and you had the Firebirds playing in Franklin Field. Uh, 6,100 people, that would have packed the stadium, um, for sure. Um, unfortunately, the Firebirds lost that game 13-7 to to Hartford. Uh, sports writer Jack Smith, anybody remember Jack Smith from the Mercury Sports, sports writer? I, I don't know, I, they, it's a lost art, but this guy was an incredible sports writer. Reading some of his uh, columns today, you, you just like are, are in awe at how, the kind of sports writer he was. But um, he, he wrote an article uh, uh, about the game, Hartford Fights Off Firebirds Rally. They don't make headlines like this anymore. I mean, he's really a, a great, uh, uh, was a great sports writer. In the game, uh, Jim Haney uh, started for the Firebirds. He was 4 for 14 for all of 36 yards, which is not a really good uh, line for a quarterback. He also had an interception. George Wilson was their substitute quarterback. He came in. He was 3-4-5 with an interception and a touchdown to Frank Antonini. Um, Antonini uh, was their leading rusher. He was 14 rushes for 56 yards. Charles Elian, or Charlie Elian, was 11 rushes for 55 yards. Again, not a real uh, great offensive output by the Firebirds. Uh, right after the game, Wilson quit the team and returned home to Florida and then Siki Moreno was uh, reactivated. So some of the things that uh, were going on in, in, in that night, you had celebrities, uh, Congressman Schweikert was there, uh, Pete Retzlaff uh, was uh, the, uh, uh, the VIP and the MC, uh, of course the crowd, the fire bells, um, it, was, it, it was a really, really uh, outstanding uh, event. Uh, back in those days, you also had marching bands at halftime, and uh, there was, again a lot, a lot of hoopla, a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of enthusiasm uh, from the game. The next, next game, a week later, is a home game against Bridgeport Jets. Uh, by the way, a reserve seat was four dollars. <laughs> For if you, yeah, for a dollar, if you, were, if you were a youngster, a student, you could get in for a dollar. Four dollars for a reserve seat. Um, on September 14th against Bridgeport Jets, the uh, uh, the Firebirds lost 24 to nothing. Uh, the Jets' blank sputtering birds was the headline in the Mercury. Uh, quarterback Haney was all of uh, four for 13, uh, uh, four four completions uh, for, uh, out of 13. Zeke Morano came in and he was three for eight. Um, 
the coach, uh, Dave DeFilippo, just said that many of the passes were dropped, so you couldn't blame it all on the quarterback. But um, at this point, it was clear that they had a quarterback issue um, in, in, in Pottstown. Uh, the offensive punch was described by the Mercury as being provided by their offensive guard, Leo Lewandowski, who returned two kickoffs for 22 yards. Now, how often does that happen today where you have your, one of your offensive linemen return kickoffs? Um, Dave DeFilippo uh, awarded the outstanding player of the game to Walt Hughes, their guard. Uh, and, and those were the two first home games and, and two very disappointing home losses. Mentioned Jack Smith. Uh, Jack Smith made the, made the very astute observation, if, the, what, if you needed to have an observation, that the Firebirds really needed a quarterback. And at this point, Benji Dial, uh, was, who was uh, on the Firebirds, ta on the Eagles taxi squad, uh, then was um, uh, sent to Pottstown. He then, uh, after another week on the bench, he then became the starting quarterback. But Benji Dial, um, came in, uh, joined the Firebirds for their third game, which was back in Herndon, Virginia. Uh, I'm sorry, their, their fourth game. Uh, their third game was in, uh, um, uh, gosh, I miss it here, but uh, Jack Smith, oh, Lowell, Mass. The third game was in Lowell, Massachusetts. Um, they actually, this is the first game that they had uh, Jim King Cochran play in a Firebirds game. Cochran, of course, was not playing for the Firebirds. He was playing for Lowell, Massachusetts, for the, uh, uh, for the Lowell Giants. Uh, Jim Haney, 13 for 27 for a touchdown, so his line was getting better. Seeking Murano was one for four, uh, one, one completion out of four. And get this, King Cochran, 11 for 25, uh, or 20, uh, 11 completions out of 25 for 204 yards, Three interceptions, two touchdowns. That was pretty typical of, of, of Jim Cochran. A lot of passing compared to everyone else. Um, but the Firebirds won 35-14. to 14. Ed Gruber got the game ball, and the Firebirds total had five interceptions. So it was, it was their first victory, and uh, very, very, uh, very welcome. At the time, no one could have, you know, could have guessed that King Cochran would be playing for them the following season. In this column, however... Uh, Jack Smith said that um, uh, made made a, an observation about Pottstown that I think was really astute. He said, "In spite of some verbal opposition, the Firebirds are good for Pottstown, and as the team improves, the town's reputation will grow. And when the team reaches champion status, the Pottstown fans will want to say that they were a part of it from the very beginning." <laughs> I mean, that is, I mean, that is some sports writer. I, I, I just, I, I, I just uh, every time I read that, just kind of remarkable how, how he predicted exactly how things would turn out. So, on, on September 28th, the following week, uh, the Firebirds go down to Virginia for their, uh, for their fourth game. Uh, Haney started the game. He was 10, for 20, uh, uh, 10 completions out of 22 for 123 yards and one interception. Uh, Benji Dial then came in. Uh, he was two for seven for only 29 yards. Now, um, this was a pretty ugly game. Uh, the Virginia Sailors won the game 10 to seven. Uh, each team had three fumbles, and the Firebirds had a very difficult time on the goal line. What was happening was that every time they got down to the goal line, and of course they 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 were like on a one yard line, and they would push the ball over. The Firebird players then claimed that the ref would take the ball from the end zone and move it back to the one-yard line, or the, or the one-foot line, okay, and claim that the Eagles did not score. And um, after the game, actually, one of the refs was suspended by, by, um, uh, by the league. So it's, it's possible that he was also, he was, um, uh, that, that this was actually true. In addition, the condition of the field, Herndon High School had just been built in the middle of nowhere, um, I should know because I lived in Herndon for seven years uh, after I returned from overseas. My son then attended Herndon High School. Mm -hmm. But Herndon High School in 1968 was brand new, and they put this, this, uh, their football field in what had been a cow pasture, 
and, it, and, and, the, and the condition of the field was no better than cow pasture, and so the players were complaining about that as well. But be that as it may, it was a loss, and at this point in the season, the Firebirds are one and three, so it's not looking to be a very successful season for them. Meanwhile, the PR effort continues. Uh, you would see ads like this in the Mercury. Um, here it says, who are the owners? Citizens of the area are the stockholders. It's your team. Firebird owners are a happy group. Then it says carpet bird. Firebirds play Harrisburg Capitals this Saturday. Be there. Okay. So, again, big effort in trying to get turnout, uh, and, and, and local uh, participation, uh, local involvement on the team. Now, on October 5th, um, you had um, Harrisburg Capitals come to town. The starting quarterback in the Harrisburg game was Benji Dial. And so he actually had a pretty successful game. He passed for 168 <coughs> yards, uh, a touchdown to John Fonash. Uh, uh, Dan Wink, I'm sorry, Dean Wink recovered a fumble uh, by the punter in the end zone for another touchdown. And the player of the week that week was Roger Grimes, a running back who had run for 77 yards uh, in, and, and had caught pa uh, passes for another 20. So this was, a, this was their first uh, home victory. And so... Um, it, again, left a, a much better taste in people's mouths, and you could look forward to maybe you know winning a few games this season. The next week, the Firebirds actually come out of their offensive shell. Uh, the, um, the the defense is rock solid, and the Firebirds win 17 to nothing over the same Virginia Sailors to whom they had lost two weeks earlier. Uh, Benji Dial uh, uh, was uh, at 16 completions, 16 for 32, for 249 yards, which was a lot of offensive yards from passing in those days. Two interceptions and a touchdown. Um, they could have had a lot more, according to the uh, uh, Dave DeFilippo. The Firebirds had made the, uh, uh, were inside the 20-yard line five times. They were inside the 10-yard line three times and failed to score. So even though they won 17 to nothing, they actually could have run up the score even higher. Um, at this point in the season, Jack Smith, the sports writer for the Mercury, questions, why wasn't the tight end Bob Pelkington playing in the NFL or the AFL? Again, a very uh, pertinent observation. Bob Pelkington was 27 years old at the time, tw uh, at the prime of his career, frankly, 6 foot 7 and 255 pounds, which would have been, a, in 1968, a really big tight end. But uh, unfortunately, at this point, he was not in the, uh, uh, in, in the NFL. So here we are, midway point of the season. The Firebirds are 3-3. Three and three. They're one game out of first place in their division. The first place team is Virginia Sailors at 4-2. and two. The best team in the league happened to be Hartford, which was the team that had beaten them in the, in the first game. But... Again, it was, it was seen as a fairly successful first half, given that they started from scratch. They were a brand new franchise. Beginning of the second half of the season, their first game uh, at, in the second half of the season was an away game in, in, in Bridgeport, Connecticut, against the Bridgeport Jets. And here, the, the, the really some, some, some issues came out because the, the game was played on Friday night. All of the other games that the ACFL played were Saturday night games. But Bridgeport had Friday night games, and I'm not sure exactly the reason why. <coughs> but so the, the Firebirds went to Bridgeport on Friday, okay, so they had a short week. And the players who were promised to the Firebirds from the Eagles <coughs> were the taxi squatters. The Eagles coach, Joe Kuharik, insisted that those taxi squatters play or, or, or practice in Philadelphia on Friday. So you had some of the better players on the Firebirds practicing in Philadelphia and then having to fly up to, Har up to Bridgeport to play in a Friday night game. Bob Calvario, uh, after the loss, he said that the birds can thank Joe Kuhair, the coach of the Eagles, who had offered taxi squatters, but made them practice all day Friday for a Friday night game, you know, that they had to fly to. 
And there was a report in the paper uh, that Roger Grimes, who came in on, the, on one of these taxi squatters, fell asleep while being taped in the dressing room. Okay. And Dave DiFilippo uh, <coughs> said that traveling for a Friday night game was a, was a real disadvantage. Um, the Firebirds lost that game 27-7, to seven, uh, which made them, of course, 3-4. and four. Just the, coincidentally, <coughs> the, both the Steelers and the Eagles, the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Philadelphia Eagles, that is, the major league teams in Pennsylvania, were both 0-6 at this time. So the Firebirds were doing a lot better than, than, the, uh, than both the Steelers and the, and the Eagles. Next week was a return uh, game with the Lowell Giants and King Cochran. Again, the second game with the Firebirds uh, as, as their uh, opposing quarterback. Firebirds again defeat the King. Uh, Benji Dial was the star. He was uh, 14th out of 23 for 251 yards, one interception, and three touchdowns. Very exciting game for, for the Firebirds. Get this, King Cochran, 22 for 44. 44 passes in a 1968 game, it's just incredible. One, one interception, two touchdowns. But again, it kind of suggests what kind of player uh, Jim King Cochran was. Uh, Roger Grimes had uh, four catches for 156 yards and two touchdowns. Uh, Roger, by the way, is a former Penn Stater. Um, he described when he played football, he said, every game is a World Series game. So he obviously must have loved his football. So at this point in the season, the Firebirds are all of 4-4. Four and four. Uh, I'll go fairly quickly through the rest of the season. But um, at this point in the season, uh, James Erdman of Douglasville was named Fan of the Year. <laughs> Again, some of the uh, headlines in the Potsdam Mercury... I, I love these headlines. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, they're uh, one syllable. You know, Firebirds lack punch. Firebirds trip Richmond. Pride stands out. Crush Colts. Rap Lowell. Cash fire. Jarbert. I, these, these are, in my view, these are tremendously uh, catchy headlines. And, and I, I wish that we would see headlines like this now. But I guess it's a lost art. The uh, the games that happened after the uh, uh, after the Lowell game. Uh, they went down to Richmond, Virginia to play uh, the Roadrunners. Richmond Roadrunners, it was a tie game. Uh, the Roadrunners tied the game uh, with uh, three minutes left. Um, and uh, they tied it on a 43-yard pass. At this point, Ed Pine was the top punter in the ACFL uh, at all of 36.2 yards per punt. So punters actually have gotten better in the last few decades. The following weekend, uh, the Firebirds had a home game against the same Richmond Roadrunners. They beat them at home 14-3 in the mud. Uh, 3,240 rain-soaked fans attended the game at Franklin Field. The net offense for the Firebirds was 150 yards. So it was a pretty, it was a pretty sloppy game. Um, Grimes uh, scored a touchdown, a 61-yard touchdown from B Benji Dial. So, 61 out of those 150 yards were from one play, a touchdown play. So it must have been. I, I don't remember the game. It must, it must, must have faded from my memory quite quickly, but it was a rain-soaked game. It was raining that day. Following week, uh, the uh, Firebirds went to Hartford, Connecticut to try to avenge that first game of the season when they